In this video, we will discuss how to find absolute max and min values of a function algebraically. So I want to first motivate a key idea through graphs, and then we'll talk about the method in general algebraically. So the example says to state the max and min values of the following graphs, if they exist. All right, so I'm going to make a table to organize this. So I'll do absolute max, and I'll make a row for the absolute min. And I'll put each of these functions as a column. So f, g, and h. All right, so let's make a table. So I'm going to separate out some rows and separate out some columns. All right, so we have this table of values. So remember that the absolute max value is the largest y value. All right, so for the function f of x, the largest y value occurs at the point negative 2, 4, and the y value is 4. All right, so my absolute max value for f is 4, and the absolute min would be the smallest y value. And looking at my graph, it seems like hmm, maybe it's at this hole, 1, negative 3, but the y values never actually reach that number. They get really, really, really close to negative 3, like negative 2.9 or negative 2.99, but they never get right at 3. I'm sorry, right at negative 3. So there's actually no absolute min. I'll write none. All right, and the reason why, we said it in words, but let's write it down. The reason why is because the y values get close. They get close to negative 3, but never reach it. But never reach it. All right, so let's identify the absolute max and min values for g. So for g, for the max, I want to know the biggest y value. And looking at my graph, the y values get bigger, 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 as big as I want, and there's no biggest y value. They sort of go on to infinity. So I would say none here for max. And the reason why is because there is no largest y value. The absolute max or the absolute min, it needs to be a finite number. I can't write infinity here because that's not an actual number. For the absolute min, it's actually the same thing as what I saw with f. The y values get really, really close to 2 going in this direction, but they never reach it. So there is none for the absolute min. But for h, this one is going to have both. The max value, the biggest y value is 4. I see that at this point, 3, 4. And the smallest y value occurs at two spots. And that smallest y value is negative 3. Alrighty, so negative 3. All right, negative 3. All right, so that said, there is something about this third graph that guarantees it's going to have an absolute max and an absolute min somewhere on this interval from negative 4 to 4 where it's defined. And that's going to be the basis of our next theorem. It's called the extreme value theorem. The conditions that I need to guarantee that an absolute max and absolute min exist are that my function f needs to be continuous and it has to be on this closed interval from a to b. Okay, if that's the case, then f attains an absolute max value, an absolute max value. I'll, I'll just call that f of c, where c is some input that will give me that max value out, and an absolute min value, an absolute min value, which I'll call f of d. So d is whatever input I would plug in to get this smallest y value out. So at some numbers, c and d in our closed interval. Okay, so looking back to our graphs, the function h was continuous on this closed interval. And the extreme value theorem guarantees that it's going to have an absolute max and an absolute min. And the absolute min actually occurred at two points, and that's totally fine. The function g was continuous, but on an open interval. It wasn't continuous at these endpoints. So the extreme value theorem doesn't apply to it. And with f, well, this function wasn't closed. Uh, sorry, it wasn't continuous. It had this discontinuity at uh, x equals 1. So the extreme value theorem doesn't apply to it either on this whole interval from negative 2 to 4. All right, so now we are ready to talk about how we're going to find absolute mins and maxes in general. So what is our process for finding 
the absolute max and min of a continuous function, a continuous function f on a closed interval from a to b. Because if my function is continuous and that interval is closed, the extreme value theorem says it should have an absolute max or an, and an absolute min. So now what's the process for finding them? So you know what? Let me actually motivate this by looking back to the graph. So the graph of this function h that was continuous on this closed interval. So if I think about where that absolute max happened, it happened at an endpoint. If I think about where the absolute min happened, it wasn't at an endpoint, but it was at places that are critical numbers. At this one, our derivative is zero. I have this horizontal tangent line. At this point where the x y is one, my derivative looks to be undefined because I seem to have this sharp corner. And that's a critical point. Okay, and that's gonna be a key idea to our process. So step one is we are gonna find the critical numbers of f in whatever interval we're talking about, a to b. And plug, we're gonna plug those in into f to see, well, what are the outputs that we get when we you know, take those numbers and plug them in? We also wanna plug in the endpoints. We're gonna plug the endpoints into f. And those are the only places, the critical numbers and the endpoints, those are the only places where the absolute max and the absolute min could possibly occur. So once you've plugged in all of these, these are the only potential candidates, then I'll put a bullet point, the largest value from one and two, the largest output that I get when I plug my numbers in, from one and two is the absolute maximum value, is the absolute, all right, max value. Okay, and similarly, the smallest the smallest value from one and two, the smallest output that I get from those candidates is the absolute min, is the absolute min value. So next, let's look at an example to see how this works. So this is example three, and it says, let f of x be equal to x squared plus eight over x plus one. I wanna find the absolute max and min values of f, and the x values at which they occur on part a asks for the interval, closed interval from zero to three, and b asks for the closed interval from zero to one. So in my head, first I could just check, hmm, these are both closed intervals, that's good. The other thing that I need to make sure is my function needs to be continuous on these closed intervals. The only place where this rational function, this polynomial over a polynomial is discontinuous is when the denominator is zero. And that's when x is negative one. But that is not part of either of these closed intervals. So our function is gonna be continuous on these closed intervals. So the extreme value theorem will tell us, oh, this is guaranteed to have an absolute max and an absolute min. I just gotta find them using that process. So first step is find the critical numbers. Find us the critical numbers. All right, so we need our derivative and we'll need quotient rule for this derivative, which gives us low d high. So low d high is derivative of the top, which is two x minus high d low. So high is the top function, d low, so times the derivative of the bottom, which is one all over low squared, so all over the bottom squared. And simplifying this, distributing 2x, we'll get 2x squared plus 2x. And then if I distribute this minus one, we'll get minus x squared minus eight, all over x plus one squared. All right, and now continuing to simplify, we'll get x squared, x squared plus 2x minus eight over 
x plus 1, that quantity squared. And the numerator now factors. It factors as x plus 4 times x minus 2. And we get that all over the quantity x plus 1 being squared. So we have our derivative. Now we need to set this equal to 0 and figure out when it's undefined to get our critical numbers. So when is our derivative equal to 0 and when is this thing undefined? When is this undefined? Okay, so this is going to be, our derivative is going to be 0 when? The only way for this fraction to be equal to 0 is if the numerator is 0. And that happens when x is negative 4 and when x is 2. It's always a good idea to check because I have variables in the, in the denominator that none of these make that denominator 0. Otherwise, they would be extraneous. And neither of these does. Neither of these makes that denominator 0. Okay, so next let's move on to when is our derivative undefined. Well, it's going to be undefined when the denominator is 0. So our derivative is undefined when x is equal to negative 1. Okay, the other thing that I need to make sure for something to be a critical number is that the values that we get need to be in the domain of the original function. So here was the original function, but if I look at negative 1, this is not in the domain of the original function. So it can't be a critical number. All right, so negative 1, this is, this is not in the domain of f of the original function. So this isn't a critical number. A critical number has to be a point on the graph. And because x equals negative 1 isn't even a point that I can plug into my original function, it's not going to be a point on that graph. Alrighty, so now we're ready to say what our critical numbers are. So our critical numbers, so we just have two of them. We have x equals negative 4 and positive 2. The next step in our process is now we want to plug in the critical numbers that are in our interval. So in part A, that was the interval, closed interval from 0 to 3. And the endpoints, the endpoints of our interval into f, the original function, to see, well, what's the biggest output? That'll be the absolute max. And what's the smallest output? That'll be the absolute min. All right, so because our interval is just from 0 to 3, one of these critical numbers I get to ignore. The negative 4, it's not even in this interval. So this is only x equals 2. So that'll be nice. It's a little bit less to plug in. All right, so let's plug in 0 into our original function. Let me first write down what the original function was. f of x was x squared plus 8 over x plus 1. So if we plug 0 into this, that's one of our endpoints. We'll get 0 squared plus 8 over 0 plus 1. And that's just 8. All right, now let's plug in. I got to plug in the other endpoint, which is 3, and the critical numbers. And that's just 2. All right, so maybe let's go to 2 first. So that'll give me 2 squared plus 8 over 2 plus 1. And simplifying this, we get, let's see, we get 12 over 3, which is 4. And then finally, plugging in the other endpoint, the 3, we'll get 3 squared plus 8 over 3 plus 1. And this becomes 17 on the top and 4 on the bottom. All right, so our process says, okay, the biggest output that I get, hmm, that's the 8. So that is our absolute max value. The absolute max value equals 8. And the problem also wanted us to say where it occurs, the x value where it occurs. And it occurs at the x value. I had to plug in 0. At the x value, 0. The smallest output is 4. 4 is smaller than 17 over 4. So that makes the 4, this is our absolute min value. The absolute min value equals 4, and it occurs at x equals, I had to plug in x equals 2. x equals 2 for this. All right, so we got our max, we got our min, Alrighty, that is our answer. Okay, and then part B, you remember. Ooh, part B of this question 
just changed up the interval a little bit and said, well, now do the same thing, but on the smaller interval from zero to one. Okay. But luckily for us, we've done most of the work already. What I need to do is we need to plug in the critical numbers, which we know already, plug in the critical numbers that are in this new interval, the closed interval from zero to one, and the endpoints, and the endpoints into the original function f. So our critical numbers were negative four and two, but none of those are in the closed interval from zero to one. Okay, so critical numbers in this closed interval, well, there are none. And that's fine, that's actually less work now, there's less to plug in. I just have to plug in the endpoints because of this. I just have to plug in zero and plug in one. And we've already plugged zero in, that gave us eight out. If we plug one in, we will get one squared plus eight over one plus one. This will be nine halves. All right, and now it's, I think this one's even easier to see. The biggest output here is eight. That's gonna be my absolute max value. This is the absolute max value. It is eight and it occurs at x equals zero. That's what I had to plug in to get out this y value, this eight. Okay, and the absolute min value is the nine halves. That's the smaller, smallest output. The absolute min value equals nine halves and it occurs at x equals one. All right, so I'm gonna box that and that that is our answer. So in terms of our goals for this section, we finished the second part of goal three, talking about the extreme value theorem and when that holds, and we've talked about the process for finding the absolute max and min values of a function algebraically.